Hey folks, okay, we're going to talk about Foot of Pride today, a great Bob Dylan song that someone requested I review a while back, and I'm glad to do it. It's from the 1983 Infidel Sessions. It was an outtake, and it popped up for those of us who have the Bootleg Series Volumes 1 through 3, popped up on here in 1991. Very, very good song. I believe uh, they did a bunch of takes of the song, and uh, Dylan was never quite happy with the performance of the recordings and all that, so it just didn't make it. I do believe that Infidel should have been made a double album because there's so many great outtakes, top-notch songs that could have been on a great double album, Infidels. It's a magnificent album, almost as magnificent as my review of it <laughs> that I posted a while back. You need to watch my review of Infidels because I talk about what I think the, song, the album's all about. It's about the fragility of faith. And what I mean by that is uh, we have certain institutions in our in life that, like it or not, we, we kind of rely on because they're beneficial institutions. They, they have a lot of value to them. However, some people um, like to take advantage of the power afforded by the institutions. They'll abuse the institutions to and use them to manipulate others and to gain from them. And so what happens is because of that, we see that and we are uh, repulsed by it. Uh, and so we, we turn our backs on the institution. We lose faith in the institutions, institutions of religion, uh, of, or of government, of labor unions, um, even of the institution of marriage and other things. All these things are great things, but because of the false teachers, if you will, the, the manipulators, we tend to lose faith in those things, and I think that's why it's called Infidels. All right, now this song, just like that album, very is very biblical, and it's about the foot of pride, about pride, basically. About thinking you could do things on your own, thinking that you could set your own rules, and you can determine what's good and evil, that kind of thing. You know, basically what happened in the Garden of Eden when Satan, and of course he was called the serpent, like he was called the serpent many times in the Bible, or the dragon or whatever. Um, he deceived Eve and Adam by telling them, hey, you don't need to listen to God. You, you, can set your, you, can, you can eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can determine on your own what's good and evil. You just take pride in yourself. You don't need him. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of the gist of what this is about as well. Let me, let me take you to Psalm 36 briefly here because that's where the, the phrase foot of pride comes from. Psalm 36. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. You don't concern yourself with God anymore. Forget that. That's old-fashioned. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath, he hath left off to be wise and to do good. He doesn't care less about wisdom and doing good. He's not interested. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good, and he abhorreth not evil. Doesn't even recognize evil, and if he does, he doesn't care. Doesn't see it for what it is. So this first four uh, verses of Psalm 36 talk about the state of man, pretty much. The next five verses talk about the state of God and his, his boundless, uh, expansive um, kindness and patience, things of that nature. And then uh, in verse 10 and 11, um, man is saying to God, O oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Continue having the patience that you have with us, because we're not perfect people. And then verse 11, Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. The song says, ain't no going back. <laughs> so the song is kind of based on that Psalm 36 where people turn their back on God and, and he get the pride of thinking that they flatter themselves and think they can do everything on their own. And, and of course, you know how that goes. Pride goeth before the fall, the old saying, right? That's kind of the gist of what the song is about, basically. Okay, Let not the foot of pride come against me and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. Okay, let's get to the song. All right, it's, it opens up with some, the first verse, the first verse is just amazing. It really sets the, the, the tone for the rest of the song, so it's really important. 
like the lion tears the flesh off of a man. Ooh. Now, you know, if a lion attacks, well, first of all, it's not going to be something that you know is coming. It's, it's, it's going to be unannounced. It's going to be a surprise. And when it, get, when it gets you, it's an easy, effortless destruction. Like the lion tears the flesh of a man. Sudden, easy, no problem. Sure. Let me take you to Hosea 13. Hosea 13 refers to the pride of Ephraim. Ephraim, Manasseh, and these other, you know, uh, members of the house of Israel. According to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Pride. Hey, man, look what all I've done here. Okay. Therefore, have they forgotten me? This is God talking. They've forgotten me, taking me out of the picture. Therefore, therefore, I will be unto them as a lion. As a leopard, by the way, will I observe them. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps and will rend the call of their heart. And there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. You've done this to yourself. But in me is thine help. So it, does, it, it doesn't want to do this, but this is what's going to have to happen. The lion tears the flesh of a man because of pride. Now the next line is another line that gets people's attention. So can a woman who passes herself off as a male. Well, is Dylan being misogynist again? Does he not like transgenders or something? No, it has nothing to do with that. Just like the second song on Infidel, Sweetheart Like You. A woman like you should be at home. That's where you belong. <laughs> people got all upset because they thought he was being misogynist. No, he's talking here about the people of God. The people of God are referred to as a woman. Many, many times. As a bride. All through the Bible. And so the people of God are that woman. Okay? But when the woman passes herself off the, as the male, the male is the God. In, in the Christian faith, Christ is, is the husband and, the, and the people, his people are the bride. So when the woman's passing herself as the male, that means the people of God are, are, are becoming God. They think that they're God. In other words, it's pride again. So that's what's happening. The lion tears the flesh off of a man because of the pride, forgetting who God, just betraying God. So can a woman who passes herself off as a male. That's basically the same thing. as hey, I don't need God. I can be everything now. Okay? They sang Danny Boy at his funeral. Now, Danny Boy is a great song. Oh, Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and the roses falling. It's you. It's you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. I'll be here in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. This is a song about a parent grieving over his, 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 his wayward child. But when you come, when you come back, and all the flowers are dying, if I am dead, as dead as I well may be, you'll come and find the place where I am lying and kneel and say, Ave, there for me, and I shall hear. Though soft you tread above me, and all my grave will be warmer, sweeter be. For you will bend and tell me that you love me, and I shall sleep in peace until you come to me. That's that loving kindness. That's that patience. I'm waiting for you to come back. You've gone off. You've, you've, you've gone on your way, but I, I'm, I'm waiting for you to come back. That's the Danny Boy song at his funeral. And the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Uh, Jesus is telling them that, you know, don't pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets so that men may be seen of them. Don't be, don't be uh, you know, showy. You know, that's pride. Hey, look at me. I'm all pious. Don't pray that way. They think that they shall be heard for their many words. Don't use vain repetitions, he says. And, he, and of course, the song is about, you know, I mean, the prayer. You know the prayer. Um, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. 
So Danny Boy talking about the love between a parent and a child that's gone astray and Lord's Prayer about the child saying, please prevent, prevent me from being tempted. Uh, keep me away from that so I can be with you. The preacher talking about Christ betrayed. It's the next line. Christ betrayed. Now, there's, there's some interesting things in the book of, um, of uh, Revelation. In Revelation 2, uh, where he's speaking to the angel of the church of Ephesus. There's the seven churches he's speaking to there, and this is the church of Ephesus. And uh, Jesus says, uh, I have something somewhat against you, uh, because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Go back to your first love. You've, fought, you've, 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 you've gone away. You've strayed away. Okay? Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Preacher talking about Christ betrayed, lost their first love. And back to the song. It's like the earth just opened and swallowed him up. He reached too high, was thrown back to the ground. You know what they say about being nice to the right people on the way up. Sooner or later, you're going to meet them coming down. That op earth opening up and swallowing is from um, it, it's referenced in, in Numbers. Numbers 16 refers to the uh, Korah, K-O-R-A-H. He was uh, an Israelite who rebelled against Moses and Aaron. He led a rebellion of over 250 people. And in number 16, it says, And it came to pass that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. And you see also in Numbers 26, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. So he's referring to uh, uh, the punishment of, of the prideful that uh, take, take it upon themselves, turn away from God. Okay, the second verse. Here you got a brother named James. Don't forget faces or names, sunken cheeks, and his blood is mixed. He looked straight into the sun and said, Revenge is mine, but he drinks, and drinks can be fixed. Some people may think this brother James is the, James, is the brother of Jesus. I don't think that's true because I believe this is Jesus speaking here. I think Jesus is speaking to John, his beloved apostle, whose brother is James. And John and James were known to be very... Well, they're, they're very passionate, John and James were. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, they were very hotly passionate and fiery in nation, nature. They were nicknamed Sons of Thunder by Jesus in Mark 3.17. So they really were gung-ho, passionate, to the point of pride. Jesus loved them dearly, but to the point of pride. And it, because, Why is that? Because they were very prideful and bold enough to dare to ask Jesus to grant them seats at his right and left when Jesus was glorified in heaven. In other words, when, you, when, when this is all done here and you're on your throne in heaven, let us be on the left and right side of you. <laughs> That's what they actually, they actually asked that question in Mark 10. And, of course, Jesus rebuked them. He loved them, but he rebuked them for this. And he told them such decision was not his to make to, to begin with. But he also said, look, are you ready? Are you, are you ready to drink from the cup that I am going to drink of? So he's looking right at him. Are you, really? You want to sit next to me? Are you ready to do what I'm about to do? To drink from the cup? And that's what the song's talking about here. He looked straight into the sun and said, revenge is mine. Powerful, but he, he drinks. And drinks can be fixed. The drinks can have a negative effect on you. Are you sure you're ready to drink what I'm about to drink? Sing me one more song about how you love me to the moon and the stranger and your fall by the sword love affair with Errol Flynn. <laughs> In these times of compassion when conformity is in fashion, say one more stupid thing to me before the final nail is driven in. Do you know how James died? In Acts 12, James died because King Herod killed James by a sword. Are you ready to drink that? that uh, cup and Jesus told him you will drink it you will drink I know you will I know you have what it takes but this is but drinks can be fixed <laughs> and hope but where they were definitely were in these times of compassion with conformities in fashion say one more stupid thing to me in other words the, the, the request you're making to me the things you're saying are, are a little naive a little stupid I love you for him but I got to rebuke you too but are you ready 
before the nail, as final nail is drawn, uh, driven in, that nail on that cross. Are you, are, you, are you ready to take up that cross, basically, and go through what I've got to go through? And many of those apostles did. I'd say about half of them were crucified. Some of them were stoned to death, and, you know, killed with swords. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, then you get the third verse here. And this one here is talking about Satan. There's a retired businessman named Red. Cast down from heaven, and he's out of his head. He feeds off of everyone that he can touch. He said he only deals in cash or sells ticket to a plane crash. He's not somebody that you play around with that much. <laughs> All right, in Revelation 12, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon. His tail drew a third part of the stars. A whole third of the angels followed him and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. There's the woman again, talking about the people of God, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. They were cast out into the earth. Oh, yeah. So he says here, there's a retired businessman named Red. Oh yeah, that's that red dragon. Cast down from heaven and he's out of his head. He only, you see, he's only got a short period of time. He knew he only had a short period of time to do what he needed to do. And so he's just passionate about it. He feeds off of everyone that he can touch. Oh, he sure does. He causeth all, both great and small, according to Revelation 13, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save that he had that mark. It says in here, he only deals in cash or sells tickets to a plane crash. He's not someone that you play around with much. You know, some people do play around with him. Next, the next line here. Miss Delilah is his. A Philistine is what she is. Now, Philistines, if you remember, the Philistine from Judges 16 is the story of Samson and Delilah. The Philistines were crude and warlike. They were enemies of, uh, of Israel in the Bible. They were deceitful and manipulative, just like Delilah was. It's funny how the Bible has these characters, Delilah, Jezebel, you know, these, these deceptive women. Uh, she'll do wondrous works with your fate, feed you coconut bread, spice buns in your bed. If you don't mind sleeping with your head face down in a plate, if you don't mind, to roll in the dice. And, of course, Samson ends up sacrificing his life to destroy his captors. You know, so it's an interesting uh, play on that uh, Samson and Delilah thing there as well. Okay. Now, the next verse, I'm pretty sure, is related to uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress from 1678. A great book I remember reading when I was a kid. It's about a, a character named Christian who meets another character named Evangelist who leads him to Wicked Gate, W-I-C-K-E-T, Wicked Gate. Okay, now keep that in mind as we read through here. Well, they'll, this is the song. They'll choose a man for you to meet tonight. You'll play the fool and learn how to walk through doors and how to enter into the gates of paradise. No, he said, no. When Christian meets evangelist, and evangelist leads him to the Wicked Gate, he thinks, this is the gates of paradise. No, it's not. No, it's not. Wicked Gate was where the King's Highway begins. And the King's Highway is where we have the burden of, of the knowledge of sins. And in the song it says, no, when you get to that gate of paradise. No, no, no. It says, how to carry a burden too heavy to be yours. This is where you're going to start carrying the burden here. You meet the evangelist. You go to the Wicked Gate. Now you got to, it's, it, it's, it's easy to pretend and, and but when you really have to when you really get into it that's when the burden begins that's when you that's where you're going to be tested yeah from the stage they'll be trying to get water out of rocks a horror will pass the hat collect a hundred grand and say thanks they like to take all this money from sin big big universities to study study in and sing amazing grace all the way to the swiss banks so I think what he's saying is the institute, the religious institution, evangelical institutions can lead you right down, you know, 
Primrose Lane. It's, that's not the end all. That's just you're just beginning to try to learn and try to build up and try to overcome all that garbage. Matter of fact, in the book of uh, Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress, Christian, he meets all kinds of things. Worldly wise man, legality, civility, goodwill, um, all kinds of characters that he's got to negotiate uh, once he's gone, the, gone this path. That's what I think that verse is referring to somewhat, is the Pilgrim's Progress. All right, the next verse here, if this verse doesn't talk about the state of man, especially in these times today. I don't know what does. They got some beautiful people out there, man. They can be a terror to your mind and show you how to hold your tongue. Hey, watch what you say. You can only say certain things. You say that thing there, you get fired. You say that thing there, you get ruined. We're going to censor what you can say. They can be a terror to your mind. Oh, man, they can cause strife to your mind. Just screw you up. Brainwashing. They got mystery written all over their forehead, like in Revelation 13. I'm talking about the forehead. They kill babies in the crib, and they say only the good die young. They don't believe in mercy. Judgment on them is something you'll never see. Judgment? Justice? Where, what is that? Where, where do you ever see that anymore? They can exalt you up or bring you down main route, turn you into anything they want you to be creating, molding people into what they should be. We know what's best for you. Oh, yeah, that's, if that doesn't describe the way things are, I don't know what does. Then we get to the last verse, okay? This last verse can refer to Moses. It can refer to Jesus or something else. But I think that's what's interesting about it, the universality of the verse. Here we go. Yes, I guess I loved him too. I can still see him in my mind climbing that hill. Did he make it to the top? Well, he probably did and dropped, struck down by the strength of the will. Now, is he talking here about Moses climbing Mount Sinai to meet with God for the, to, to get the commandments, you know? While Aaron and all the rest of the Israelites were all losing their minds. You know that story, right? Or is he talking about Jesus climbing that skull-shaped hill? Golgotha, known as Calvary, to, to be hung on that cross. So which one is he talking about? I can think he could be talking about either one here. Ain't nothing left here, partner, just the dust of a plague that has left this whole town afraid. Is he talking about Egypt in Exodus, where all the Israelites were left, at, left Egypt and, and the plagues just descended on Egypt and turned the whole place into, you know what, could be talking about that, and I'll show you how I think that in a minute. Or is he just talking about the state of man, the state of the world, post-Jesus crucifixion? From now on, this will be where you're from, he says. Let the bur dead bury the dead. Your time will come. Let hot iron blow as he raised the shade. That, that, that hot iron blow part, as well as this is where you're from, from now on, kind of makes me think it's Egypt. Let me explain to you what I mean. All right, going back to Hosea 13, what we talked about earlier. Uh, God says, yes, I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. He refers to that quite often when he's talking to the Israelites, to his people. He refers to, I brought you out of Egypt. He said that many, many times. I brought you out of Egypt. Okay? Jeremiah 11, 4. Which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, voice and do them according to all which I command ye, so shall you, shall you be my people, and I will be your God. And in Deuteronomy 4 it says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, that is Egypt, out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance to this very day. And so when I hear the lyrics saying, um, um, there's nothing left in this town, just the dust of a plague that has left the whole town afraid. From now on, this will be from where you're from. Let the dead bury the dead. Your time will come. Let hot iron blow as he raised the shade. Raise the shade. Let the light in. So I'm kind of thinking that it could be about Moses climbing Mount, Arif, uh, Mount uh, Sinai. And uh, the, the Israel, Israelites referring to them leaving Egypt. Or it could be about 
you know, Jesus climbing the Golgotha to be hung, to be sacrificed, and the state of man since then, okay? From now on, this will be where you're from. This is the new starting point. This is where you can gain rebirth, so to speak, and become that new person. That could be that, what he's talking about. Let the dead bury the dead. That's from Luke 9, where Jesus says, follow me, you let the dead bury the dead. Don't concern yourself with them, the world. You can follow me. Okay, and then the the the, the, ch the chorus that repeats all throughout and that ends the song is, well, there ain't no going back when your foot of pride come down, ain't no going back. Well, in that in that Luke 9, I was just telling you where Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Two verses later, he says, Jesus says unto them, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Ain't no going back. You don't look back. And um, so that's what I kind of think the song's all about. Uh, of course, uh, opinions can vary, obviously. It's a very rich song with many layers, many different uh, possible interpretive opportunities there. Uh, but I definitely see a ton of biblical passages that are referred to, uh, all about pride um, and, and, and pride in oneself because, of, you know, things are going well. And so you get pride in yourself and you just simply deviate from your first love. You deviate from the thing that your creator, basically. You deviate from from God and what is truly good and evil, and you create uh, your own uh, uh, scales of measuring good and evil on your own. You don't need anybody to tell you anything. That basically was the first sin in the Garden of Eden. That was basically it, and we're still de dealing with it today, so to speak. You see, that foot of pride. Let not that foot of pride. What was it again? Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. Oh, yeah. I think that's what it's about, folks. It's a great song. It, it should have been on Infidels, along with a lot of those other great Infidels outtakes. I don't know. What do you guys think? I may be completely wrong, but uh, I don't know. There's too many coincidences there for me to think I'm wrong. I, I think I'm right. <laughs> Whatever. I got too much pride. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.